So it was this conference in May of 2019. It was a celebration, the 125th anniversary of the Disciples Divinity House at the University of Chicago. So it's this venerable institution that's been training young women, men, people for 125 years to be religious leaders. And there were speakers and, um, you know, breakout sessions and poets and slam poets and singers. And all. It was just really a rich, rich few days. And the thing that meant the most to me, though, was the title of the conference, which was Grateful for What is to Come. I just thought, well, that's quite the title. I mean, on the one hand, they were spending this weekend kind of looking back at their history and all the people who had helped found this and all the great leaders who'd gone before. But it was also like, whatever comes in this world that we all know is pretty shredded and torn, we're going to be grateful for what is to come. You know, it's like what we heard last week, you know, where we just live in this orientation of gratitude, where we really feel connected and wake each day and know that, you know, everything comes to us as a gift, our family, you know, the bread we eat, the life we have, and we're living in this kind of, you know, kind of in the groove of being a loving, caring person. Um, I like that so much that we used it, I think last year, the year before for our stewardship campaign, grateful for what is to come. But who knew really in May of 2019 what was to come? <laughs> because within a year, right, we had COVID and the shutdown and then the murder of George Floyd and then the uprising. And then in the time since then, you know, just all kinds of fallout. And so they just had um, another conference, their first conference kind of post COVID um, this summer. And the title for this at the University of Chicago was um, what kind of goodness can come from such unimaginable times? And that title has really stuck with me. What kind of goodness can come from such unimaginable times? I mean, these times, they're pretty unimaginable. I think of the headline a couple of, just a few months ago that said, US passes 1 million COVID deaths. I mean, that's unimaginable. It's a thousand a day. And then the fallout from that, you know, where we've seen people evicted, we've seen a housing crisis, we've seen crisis in the workforce, crisis in education. How about the headline this week in the Los Angeles Times, LA schools missing 20,000 students from their rosters. That's not kids who have gone to charter or private or homeschooling. That's kids who are missing. They had 50,000 absences on the first day, but they got 20,000 kids they can't find. Some of those kids are older, they went into the workforce, just out, no high school, but a lot of those kids are little. They're the preschool, they're the kindergarten, they're the little ones, and they think some of it's immigration, people being afraid of who knows what. I mean, and across the nation, the number is more like two million kids who are just somehow not in school. I mean, that's unimaginable, right? And so we find ourselves in this place of thinking, oh my gosh, things are really kind of crazy, aren't they? I mean, not just, you know, the usual, but also the own stuff that we struggle with, right? Our own crisis, our cancer, and the climate, and what's going on. And the prophet Jeremiah was speaking in a time in which people felt the world was so beyond what they could imagine. I mean, literally, they're the Ukrainians at this moment. They're ripped out of their house, out of their home, and they're taken to a foreign land, and nothing they see is what they know. And Jeremiah, you know, to his, uh, you know, I don't know, credit, is this prophet who's been telling them, you know, this isn't just about, um, you know, a foreign power that's more mighty. This is about you. This is about you people have lost your way. You have forgotten who made you. You have forgotten what it means to be a person. You have forgotten what it means to love. You have forgotten what it means to care for other people. You have forgotten the poor. You've chased away and you've made these systems of domination and oppression. And, you know, people didn't really want to hear what Jeremiah was saying. But what Jeremiah was saying was something that, as a pastor, you always know is critical whenever anybody wants to make change. The very first step is what? recognizing the problem, 
crying out. I mean, if there's anything I've learned in 35 years of being a pastor, grief is what permits newness. If you can't grieve something, you can't move on, right? I mean, that's what we know in recovery. Any kind of AA group, OA, narcot, everything is like you've got to own the problem. You've got to grieve what it is. It's true in the counselor's office. It's true in politics. We've got to be able to admit, hello, the society actually was safe founded in slavery, founded in brokenness. If we can't admit that and look at it, how can we heal and move on? So the first step is always crying out and criticizing. And that's what the prophets always do. That's always the movement. It's always the movement to change. It's always the movement when a relationship has become stale, when something is broken, when you're not who your, your best self is. You've got to cry out. You've got to criticize. And then the second step that the prophets always make is energizing, is dreaming, is imagining. And that can be just as hard, right? Because we live in a country that can do what? Implement anything and imagine nothing. I mean, you know, we have another war, we put more money in the military budget. I mean, it's not like, can we imagine a different way forward? And so trying to dream and trying to imagine, and so Jeremiah comes along after the people have been kind of ripped out of their home, and then he starts talking hope. He says, hey, you know what, one day, you're going to buy a field and there's going to be trees that are going to flourish and there's going to be cisterns that are going to be full of water and there's going to be another land of milk and honey. And in the Gospel of Luke, you hear kind of another fresh take on that, which is Jesus saying, stop it. Stop trying to work the room. Stop trying the back room deal. Stop trying to always climb on top of other people. Stop worrying about what people think. And, and Jesus kind of lays out this image of it's kind of like a societal big banquet where, you know, here's the Kaufmans over here and you're trying to sit next to the Kaufmans and maybe you can get a grant, right? Or it's a junior high lunchroom, you know what I mean? And here's the popular girl or the popular guy at the lunchroom and what does everybody want to do? Try to sit by that person, right? And Jesus is saying, enough of this. Stop it. Quit it. He's saying, stop it. Try to imagine a world where instead of trying to um, always be, I'll do this and you'll do that and you do this and I'll do that, instead you love and you live freely. Instead he says, hey, don't invite the people who can repay you, in fact. In fact, invite the people who can't repay you. Invite the blind and the lame and the poor and the disabled so that you're not, you know, I'm inviting you to my party, my daughter's big wedding, so that then you'll invite me to your daughter's wedding. It's instead a way of living that you know what? Free. And so what you do is you're setting the other person free because you're not expecting them to give you anything back. And what else happens? You're free, right? Because you're no longer expecting anything from anybody else. And we've talked about that love a lot. It's what we hear in 1 Corinthians 13. It's Kierkegaard. It's this, you believe all things. You just love someone and you're not worried about how they're going to treat you back. You just love them. And then you're just set free, right? And I think about that as a parent right now who has two kids in their 20s. And I'm telling you what, a lot of what I think of as love is really Holly trying to control. You know, it really is. And I'm like, I just told, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to have to stop here. <laughs> I'm going to have to stop here and not say, but I'm like, why can't you do it just exactly like I did? You know, I, I mean, the world would be so much better, you know, really. I mean, if you could just do this and be be safe and do it this way. It's same thing with my husband, you know. I mean, it's just like, and, and that's not really love, right? That's That's not really caring and being graceful and being open. And so what kind of Jesus is inviting us into, and he's not really probably talking about teenagers or young adults, but he's talking about a different way of living in the world where we're really not trying to control, but we're trying to set free, and we're trying to imagine something different. And when I try to think about who I see around me today who is living this way, I tell you who comes to mind, the young people. You know, I'm now hitting 60, so I've had the, you know, Gen X and the Millennial, and now the Gen Z. And I'm telling you what, young people, from what I can see, they're out there. They're first crying out. They're a bunch of Jeremiah's, Jeremiah's and that young people, that young group there on the streets. They're knocking doors. They're canvassing. They're saying the world's on fire. We've got to make change. They're looking to one another to have much more real and authentic relationships. Like, I don't know how many of you know Maxwell Alejandro Frost. He's my new hero. Maxwell Alejandro Frost is 25 years old. He lives in Orlando. He's an activist. He's been an activist since he was 15. He didn't grow up in a cushy home. His birth mother was Lebanese, Puerto Rican. His father was Haitian. 
and his mother couldn't care for him because he was her seventh child and she was caught in that vortex of poverty and drugs and violence. And so she gave him up for adoption. And his birth mother, and his adopted mother was Cuban. She had come here with her mother and sister fleeing the, you know, Castro in the 60s. And her grandmother, his grandmother, um, worked in the factories in Miami 70 hours a week, so was oppressed and exploited. So he grew up knowing the streets, but he also grew up touched and called. He grew up in a family of faith. He grew up knowing he was a child of God. He grew up, as he said, set in the pathway of Christ. And when he was 15, the Lord touched him. I'm just telling you, the Lord touched this kid because Sandy Hook happened, and he was in Orlando, Florida, and he said, I'm going to Washington, D.C. for that vigil in March, and he has never stopped. He's been the national director of the March for Our Lives. He was one of the ACLU directors that won the restitution of voting rights for 1.6 million Floridians in the historic midterm four years ago when those people who had been prohibited from voting were allowed to vote. He's been on the front line of reproductive justice and gun control and climate change. And Tuesday night, he made a history. He won his primary in Florida and is on his way to being the very first person in Gen Z to be elected to Congress. He's 25 years old. He's expected to win his race. But what's so impressive about him is he the kid's a preacher. You hear him, and it, you know, for those of us who remember the young Barack Obama in 2004, remember when he stood up there at the Democratic Convention, he talked about this country, what we could be how we could love one another, how we could come together, how yes we could, and you heard that, and you thought, that's what we're looking for, and that's, that's Maxwell. I've heard him preach, I've heard him preach, I've heard him talk about love, he talks about love a lot. He talks about when you love somebody, guess what? You want them to have health care. When you love somebody, guess what? You want them to have clean drinking water. When you love somebody, you want them to have safe streets. And he talks about what it means to come together and, and to put that love into action, which he calls justice. And he's creating this campaign, this young kid. He's a musician. He's an Uber driver. Um, he's just creating it with all these people around him. And now, of course, big endorsements from other people when it raises a lot of money. Um, and I've been thinking about him because I've been thinking about my own life and what am I doing right now in these unimaginable times. I would give myself a pretty high grade when it comes to getting out there kind of gotten out there and volunteering and do more, you know, than I used to, kind of pushing myself. But then when I think about my own closest relationships, boy, that need to control, it is just right there. And then I hear a young man like Maxwell and that invitation to love, that invitation, he says, because somebody loved me, but somebody loved him. Somebody loved him and he can love other people. And what does that look like? What kind of goodness can come from unimaginable times? If we'll use this time, right, to look at our lives honestly, to kind of hold them up, to think, you know, how am I doing, what am I doing, and to kind of imagine, you know, looking at the real moments when we failed and kind of grieving that, hurting from that, letting it go, imagining more, trying to shape our lives, all kinds of goodness can come from this. May this season in which God continues to touch us and to call us and to invite us into a future of hope and justice send us on our way. Amen.